Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's about time to begin our worship service this morning. Give everybody a chance to, to, to sit down. So good to be here with you all this snowy morning to, to worship God together. Appreciate seeing each and every one of you. If you're visiting here with us this morning, we extend a special welcome to you. would like to uh, remind everyone that we have a, uh, an attended nursery uh, in, in, in the, to, to, my, to my left here and then back down the hallway, you'll, you'll see that. We also have a, uh, an unattended nursery uh, through the foyer and then, and then to the left associated with the, the ladies' restroom, if, that, if you need that. Also, we, have, uh, we will have some announcements at the end of the service today, and there'll be some young men, I believe, that will come and pick up the blue card. To, can, so if, you, if you're visiting with us or if you have a, some, other, some other need, uh, fill out that blue card and, and send, send that to the end of the aisle. There'll also be some, some uh, very young ladies uh, going around passing out some, some welcome bread uh, for you so you can get ready to raise your hand at that time. We'll, uh, we'll begin our service this morning with a prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, you are so wonderful to us. You are, you are, you are so majestic that we take this time to, to consider you to, to, and, 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 to, and to offer our worship to you this morning. We pray that uh, as, we, as, we, as we do this, that you would help us to to put away those cares of the world, to, to fully uh, engage ourselves into, uh, in, in, into this worship. Father, we, we want to always remember your, your glory, your goodness and kindness and your love for us. Father, we, uh, we pray that, uh, that uh, everything that we do here this morning will, will be in accordance with your will. Father, we pray for those who who are who may still be traveling here um, and we pray for safety as, as they arrive here and as, as we all as we all depart later on uh, we pray for those who who are not able to to be here this morning uh, for, for whatever reason uh, that that you would that you would uh, that we, that be with them and, and help them in their, their situation father we once again uh, give thanks to you for for your great kindness to us, for the blessings that you rain down upon us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We will open up with number 279, Give Me the Bible. First and fourth verses. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer, lone and tempest-tossed. No storm can hide that radiance peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, lamp of life immortal, hold up that splendor by the open grave. Show me the light from heaven's shining portal. Show me the glory gilding Jordan's wave. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combine. 
Till night shall vanish in eternal day. And the song before our second prayer will be number 259. Ring out the message. There's a message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Ring it out, ring it out. It will give them courage new, it will help them to be true. Ring it out, ring it out, ring out the word or land. Still far from Jesus, many live in sin and doubt. Bring out the news that makes men free to all the lost of every nation. Tell the world of saving grace, make it known in every place. Ring it out, ring it out. Help the needy ones to know him from whom all blessings flow. Ring it out, ring it out, ring out the word or land. So far from Jesus, many live in sin and doubt. Bring out the news that makes men free to all the lost of every nation. Sin and doubt to sweep away till shall dawn the better day. Bring it out, bring it out, till the sinful world be won for Jehovah's mighty Son. Bring it out, bring it out, bring out the word or land. Still far from Jesus, many live in sin and doubt. Bring out the news that makes men free to all the lost of every nation. Let us bow. Our dear and most loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day, for this time that we have to be here. We're thankful, Lord, for the snow and the moisture that we receive from it. We're so thankful for the beauty also, Lord, that surrounds us. We're so thankful for each one who is here this morning. We ask that you would be with the ones who are not here also, be with those who are sick or those who are traveling or those who are just not here because they would rather do something else, we ask that you would be with them and strengthen them. We pray, Lord, you would be with us now on through this time that what is said and done will be in accordance with your word, your will. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Grady today as he brings our lesson, that he'll have a ready recollection of the things he studied. And be with each one of us, Lord, that we open up our hearts and our ears to the word that he says and to your word, Help it to, that we would listen to it and understand it and be able to use it in our lives, Lord. 
We pray, Lord, you would be with those who are have been mentioned that are sick at this time. We, we have many, Lord, and we ask that you would be with each one and strengthen them and help them in the ways that you know best. We pray, Lord, you would be with our country that we'll continue to have peace, that we'll be able to worship you without harm. We ask that you would be with those over in the Middle East, that they are strengthened at this time also, and care for them in the way that you know best. We just pray, Lord, you'd be with the missionaries wherever they are also, that they will not lose heart, that they will be not discouraged for all the different things that are going on, that they will continue to bring souls unto you. We pray you be with us right here in Colorado Springs, that we will be ready to bring those who are questioning or wondering what we have in our lives that they don't have. Help us to be bold and to be able to relay those things unto them. We pray, Lord, you would forgive us of our sins. Help us to realize that what we're doing is wrong and that we do need to do what is right. Help us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. And the song before our Lord's Supper this morning will be number 367. And we'll sing the first and second verses. <clears throat> Take my life and let it be My sisters and brothers, is everyone prepared to partake of the Lord's Supper? In the last week of his life, after the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, Jesus told his apostles, two of them, Peter and John, to follow a man carrying water, which was in itself unique because in that culture, women carried water unless you remember the sect of the Essenes, where there are no women, and therefore the men carried the water. And thus they followed him to a house and told him that my master desires a room where we might partake of the Passover. And there was an upper room which the disciples prepared for the Passover. The Passover is important. It's important to the Jews because it signifies as the last plague that was afflicted upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians, that it was an escape from the slavery of Egypt into spiritual freedom. And they were required to sacrifice a lamb, a male lamb, of one year of age without flaw, and to put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel of their homes. That evening when the angel of destruction came by, he passed over all of the houses that had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the lintel. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us that Jesus is our Passover lamb. And thus his sacrifice allows us to move into spiritual freedom, into the kingdom that the Lord has established for us. On that night in the upper room, Jesus, after they were eating, and this is from Matthew 26, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. 
This is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And this morning we are in the Father's kingdom. We are partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine in the presence of Jesus, our Passover lamb. Let's give thanks. From the beginning, O Lord, we praise your name for you have had a plan and a purpose for us. And when your Son and our Savior came, he shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins for the many and for each of us. And as we take of this bread, O Lord, we thank you. It represents his body, nailed to the cross, pierced by Roman spears, and given as a sacrifice that we might be reconciled with you in a new covenant. Father, we thank you for such a great sacrifice as this. We praise your name and give honor to you and to your son Jesus in this prayer. Amen. In a similar manner, O Lord, we continue our prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Knowing that you have blessed the bread and the fruit of the vine. And now as we partake of the fruit of the vine, we're reminded in our hearts and in our minds that this is the symbol of a new covenant. Replacing all the covenants of the past with their ordinances and rules. And giving us the role of priest in your kingdom. Heirs to the promise and Christians bearing proudly the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you, O Lord, that you have done this for us. May all glory and honor and praise ascend to your name and to the name of Jesus. Amen. Fourth verse of Take My Life and Let It Be before, commun before our offering. <clears throat> Take my sil... Correction, sorry. That's the other song. <laughs> Take my silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold. Take This is now the moment to ask the Lord to bless our offering. Behind me on the screen are many ways our members all know to present your offering. Of your financial resources, of your time, of your mind, of your heart. The Lord has been generous towards us. He's blessed us with many things. And he's also blessed us with the knowledge that there are those who have need, both of material things and of the knowledge of the word of the good news of Jesus. 
And so let's offer thanks for all the things the Lord has done for us. As we come before you, Lord, with humility and reverence in our hearts, we acknowledge you as the God of creation, the author of our salvation, and the provider of all good things through Christ Jesus. You've amassed this great treasure before us, Lord, and given to us a share of it. And we pray, O oh Lord, that our faith would be sufficient to know that you will never stop, that you'll continue to bless us and give us the things that we have need of. And you've given us an opportunity now, Lord, to present an offering to you, not out of duty, but out of willingness and joy that we serve a living God who sent his Son to be our Savior. So we ask you, Lord, to bless the offering that's presented today and those who have provided it. And let us continue, O Lord, to be stalwart in our service, that we may continue to provide for the needs of the congregation and the others. And we offer this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you please stand on our feet for the scripture reading? This morning's scripture reading is coming from Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound, a sound like the blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house when, uh, where they were sitting. They saw that they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Yesterday afternoon, I had a text from Kevin saying that he just wasn't feeling well at all. He had a birthday Thursday. He's another year older. That's probably some of it. He said he had a flu shot, and it worked because he thought he was coming down with the flu. But he thought that he would be here, and then last night, he sent another text saying, I know it's last minute, but he's just not feeling good at all. And that's not a problem. Most preachers that I know, they've got a file, they've got a drawer, uh, they've got a stash somewhere. And if they need to come up with a lesson, kind of last minute or unexpected, well, it's just a matter of reaching in there and dusting off an outline, something that's been prepared just in case. So this morning you have a just-in-case sermon. And it's one that has to do with the day of Pentecost. And I've got dozens of those lessons. Back when I was a real young fellow, my dad challenged me, Grady, you know what you ought to do? You ought to memorize the second chapter of the book of Acts. And once a year or so, you ought to preach from the second chapter of the book of Acts. Not the same sermon over and over and over again, but different aspects and different ways of presenting what happened on that great and on that wonderful day. Well, I've mostly done that, if not one sermon every single year, pretty close to it. And so I have about 50 lessons based on Acts chapter 2. And I encourage you to open your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 2 not that we're going to read the whole chapter, and in fact, 
The way that we're going to develop this lesson, we're going to talk about some things that are not written there. And I'll explain that in a moment. About 50 years or so ago, one of our brethren published a book that he called The Hub of the Bible. And in your mind's eye, you can see maybe the wagon wheel, and you've got the rim going around on the outside, and you've got the spokes coming in, and that center hub. Well, he said Acts chapter 2 is the hub of the Bible. In the Old Testament, we have prophecies of the coming day when God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh, Joel chapter 2. We have the prophecies that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established, Isaiah chapter 2. And we see all of this coming together in Acts chapter 2. Pentecost is a word, it's a Greek word, and it means the 50th day. So it's the 50th day after the Passover. And from reading John chapter 19, the Passover fell on a Sabbath. Resurrection morning was on the first day of the week. And then if you count 50 days from that, the 8th day was a Sunday. The 15th day, the 22nd day, the 29th day, the 36th day, the 43rd day, and the 50th day was on a Sunday morning. And there all the people were gathered together in Jerusalem to celebrate a harvest feast 50 days after Passover and the resurrection of Jesus. And then something wonderful happened that you can see there on the monitor. The Spirit fell upon the apostles, and it was a visible, it was an audible, it was an unmistakable event. And they began to speak in languages that they had never studied, and they spread out through Jerusalem, they converged on the Temple Mount, and for the very first time anywhere, at any time, Jesus of Nazareth was proclaimed to be the risen Lord, the risen Christ. And people were told for the very first time anywhere to do something in the name of Jesus Christ. And so in anyone's Bible, Acts chapter 2 is kind of a watershed of it. We can divide God's scheme of redemption before Acts 2 and after Acts 2. There's the establishment of the church and there's the beginning of the gospel as it's preached first in Jerusalem and then into all the world just as Jesus commissioned and told His disciples to go into all the world. It began in Jerusalem and it began on the day of Pentecost. And you recall from reading that chapter what a stir, what excitement began to bubble up and boil in that city. Something strange is going on. There's men and they're preaching in different languages and all the strangers who come to Jerusalem the Jews who lived in foreign lands, they're hearing the same message in their own words, in their own language, and to beat it off. These fellows that are doing that, they're fishermen from Galilee. They're unlearned. They're not scholars at all, but they're just the plain peasants from the countryside and they're speaking things that we simply can't count for. One smart elder says, well, they're drunk. That's what's going on. You know, drunks do funny things. Sometimes drunks do puzzling things. And that's when Peter got up and said, no, it's too early in the morning. That won't explain. Let me tell you what's really going on. 
And so when your mind's up, can you see a little bit of that scenery? It's around the temple courtyards. Tens of thousands are there. And the apostles, 11 of them, one's over here and one's over there. One's back here, one's out there. And they're all preaching and teaching and declaring the risen Lord and how that up from the grave he arose. And the people are astounded. But after the charge of drunkenness, it seems that Peter took the lead. And those aren't the words recorded in Acts chapter 2. Peter said, ye men of Israel, listen to me. God is made. That same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ, you took him and by wicked hands you crucified him. But God has raised him up. It wasn't fitting. It wasn't according to his purpose and plan that he be among the dead. God has raised him up and we are witnesses of these things. And Peter went on and began to demonstrate, quoting Old Testament Scripture, tying it all together. Here's God's scheme of redemption, and it's through Jesus of Nazareth, the Lord in Christ. And after a while, the people, the same people, who had stood in Pilate's judgment hall and cried out, Crucify! Away with it! Let his blood be on us and on our children. The very same people that had stood and mocked our Lord while he hung, while he died on the cross. We read how they were pricked in their heart. They were cut to the quick. They were moved with their own sense of guilt and responsibility. And they cried out, tell us what we can do. How in the world can we undo? How in the world can we be forgiven from such a deed? And that's when Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, and you shall be received the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we read how that, that same day, 3,000 were added to the number of the apostles, and there's the beginning of God's family, you and I call the church. A great day. A wonderful day. A day not to be forgotten, and a day to be reminded of every now and then. But for our lesson this morning, we want to talk about some things that didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. We want to reference Acts chapter 2, but we want to talk about some things that didn't take place there. And there it is. Things that didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. And you know, when we read God's Word, and there's the text, it's important to know carefully what it says. And then maybe also pay attention to what it does say. To what happened. And also, what didn't happen. So here I think is just a little bit of a different take, a little bit of a different twist on an old, old, familiar story. It didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. And number one, there the preaching of Peter and the rest of the apostles. There was no competing. There was no confusion. There was no contradictory message. And there was absolutely no disagreement among the people, what they were hearing and what they were needing to do. Eleven preachers on Pentecost and twelve counting Matthias, the newest apostle that had been added in Acts chapter 1. 
So 12 different speakers. There for a time, all preaching at the same time. And when we remember that the temple platform around the temple in Jerusalem, it was about 35 football fields joined together. Twelve preachers covering that bit of ground. Why, you had a group here and there and everywhere. And twelve men preaching a sermon about Jesus. Let's suppose this morning, this snowy morning, I think we've already had some people, some elderly people on their walkers looking at the streets, and they've left us, and that's all right. But let's suppose that we could do a canvas, we could do a survey. We could go up and down the boulevards and the highways and the byways of Colorado Springs and listen in to 12 different preachers this morning. And don't you know, we would hear 12 different takes, 12 different interpretations, 12 different speeds on what is supposed to be the one gospel of Jesus our Lord. That's the reality of the world that we live in. And that's not being ugly, that's not being critical so much of any person in particular. It's just the way things are. And I suppose if we had the text set up, which we don't have. And what we have doesn't always work flawlessly and reliably. But we could split these big monitors in the auditorium and there's probably 12 churches in Colorado Springs that are live streaming their services, don't you think? At least 12. Maybe a whole lot more than that. We record our services one Sunday we polish it up a little bit. We edit it. We put a filter on the audio that takes away my accent. And then we broadcast it the next week. We don't live stream, but some churches do. And you can imagine on the monitor if we could split it up to 12 different churches, 12 different preachers, and we would hear with our own ears. Twelve different takes on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That didn't happen in the long ago. That didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. Peter, Philip, Andrew, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthias, all the apostles, even though they may not have been standing together at first, they were all saved the same thing. They were all preaching and teaching the same truth. They were all declaring the same wisdom of God and they were in agreement and in fellowship and there was absolutely no confusion. Someone did come from this group and say, well, he said to do this. And someone said, well, I was over there with the other group and he said to do that. No, on the day of Pentecost. There's no confusion as to the message preached, the authority cited, or the response demanded. There was this unanimous agreement. They were declaring all together the same thing, what Jesus had declared. And you know, when Peter came to the point and said, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to be, you need to repent and be baptized. Every one of you. No one shot up a hand and waved it and said, well, now then baptism. Don't you know that's an outward sign of an inward grace? You won't find that language in the New Testament but you will find it in some denominational creeds. 
Baptism, that's what you do after you're saved. And it's not so much a witness to God. God knows you and your heart, but it's to demonstrate to other people that now you're putting on Christ and going to walk with Him. But notice what Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you for the remission of sins have a flashback. Go back to the 5th and 6th and 7th grade in English class where you were diagramming sentences. I don't ever want to go back to those days myself. But diagram Acts 2.38. And there's the two leading verbs. There's the subject, you, and it's implied, and in the Greek it's in part of the verb tense itself. You repent and you be baptized, and then that clause that explains and supports and clarifies. Why? To have your sins remitted. That's what remission means. To have your sins erased, blotted out. And when you do, the gift of God's Spirit will be yours. And then immediately we read as many as received the word were baptized, and that day 3,000 of them. Mentioned baptism today. And there's pushback. And how in the world and why in the world is that the case? When Peter said, not just be baptized, but repent. And you'll go a long, long way before you'll find someone who will dare to say, I don't think God really wants us to repent. That's not necessary. That's optional. And Peter joined them together to repent and be baptized. There was no pushback on the day of Pentecost. Number three, no babies were baptized. Not a single one. Oh, Bernie, don't you love the babies? It's a wonderful thing here at Pikes Peak. We've got some sisters that are carrying that precious fruit of the womb. And they're in our prayers every single day. We love children as much as anyone. I would even declare we just love children more than anyone. Well, that's kind of hard to prove, but there's the assertion. Deal with it. Nothing against the babies. And yet when we begin to read the New Testament, there's not the first mention of any child that is baptized or sprinkled or pulled. Read church history. And you begin to find out that all two and three and four hundred years later, Children began to be christened. And that became a part, a prominent part, of the teaching of some churches. But we don't read about it in the Bible. Peter said, verse 36 of Acts chapter 2, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly babies, bless their heart, can't understand the story of Jesus. All they know is mom and dad. Dad after a while. Maybe. And they know when they're warm and they know when they're tired and they know when they're hungry and there are some other things they know we won't go into. But as far as an understanding of what sin is and salvation and the role that Jesus played in God's eternal scheme of redemption, an infant can't know any of that. And then an infant can't repent. An infant has nothing to repent of. And pouring a little water on the head is not Bible baptism. And we don't question the sincerity, the goodness of heart, and love for the Lord and those who want to do that, but it didn't happen on the day of Pentecost, did it? 
And on the day of Pentecost, no one listened to the sermon, decided to put on Jesus in baptism, made a brand new start of their life, and then go out looking for a church that suited them to join. We're long past the days of the big arena revivals, the football stadium revivals. Those of you that maybe are not youngsters, no offense, you can remember the big evangelistic campaigns and there would be the hundreds and the thousands coming forward at the invitation song. And there would be the area preachers and teachers that would counsel with them. And some would become Catholic, some would become Presbyterian, some would become Baptist, some would become Episcopalian, some would go to the Church of God, some would go to the Church of Christ. And whatever suited, that's what they would do. And we don't read about that on the day of Pentecost, do we? They didn't join the church of their choice. They were added to the church of our Lord. And that's the Pentecost story. And no one said, well, Peter, you got me. But just as soon as you mentioned church, you turned me up. Don't get up. I can love the Lord and worship and praise Him just as much as I can up in the mountains that I can in any church auditorium. The church that organized religion I'm spiritual, but I just, just don't care for the church. Well, that sentiment, that expression, that came a lot later. It didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. There was an understanding that the same act that brings us into Jesus is the same act that brings us into his family. And then one last point on the day of Pentecost, no one was voted in or excluded from the church. Oh, you know how it is. Let's say we have somebody come forward this morning and they relate their testimony how they felt that they were beyond the reach of God's saving grace, but then the light came on and they tell us how they were moved and how they were born and they share with us their story. And then we vote whether or not they're going to be a part of our fellowship. None of us. It doesn't surprise any of you that that goes on, but that's not what happened on the day of Pentecost, was it? And the very idea, the notion, that you and I can include or exclude, that's way above our paper. The Lord adds to the church, Acts 2 47. It's not you, it's not me. And since it's the Lord's business, we don't exclude, we don't excommunicate. Church discipline is not bad. We may declare that we will not go along and we will not endorse a sin that one of our brothers and sisters may be doing, but we can't kick anyone out of the church. That's the Lord's business. He is the gatekeeper. And on the day of Pentecost, these things didn't happen. Here at Pines Peak, we want to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. We want to do Bible things in Bible ways. We want to call Bible things by Bible names. When there's a question of what must we do, what should we do? What can we do? One of the first things that we want to do is open God's book and see if there's any way outlined in that. We don't claim to be smarter. 
more spiritual, better, love the Lord more than anyone else in all the whole wide world. But you know, if we're going to speak where the Bible speaks, there's a lot of things that have been added to the Bible. There's a lot of things that have been piled on top of God's book. There's a lot of things that I like, you know, and I would do it this way. And there's a lot of things that you like, and you would do it that way. And that's another discussion for another time. This morning we're looking at the beginning of God's family that we call the church. What happened on the day of Pentecost? And some things that didn't happen then. And it didn't happen in the next chapter of the book of Acts. And we can't read about it in the book of Romans. And we can't read about it in the book of Jude. And we can't find it anywhere in the New Testament. And then we go to history and find that it was added hundreds of years after Jesus lived and died. Well, let's just go back to the source. Let's go back to the beginning, if we could. That doesn't mean we're going to replace our cars with a horse and buggy. Doesn't mean that from now on we're going to walk to the church building instead of a modern way of transportation. Doesn't mean that we're going to give up buttons and instead we're going to use hooks on our clothing because that's the old way. Well, it's the old way, but it's not old enough. It doesn't go all the way back to the New Testament. It doesn't mean that we can't have modern medicine, electricity, lights, monitors, and a working microphone. It doesn't mean that we're going to forswear every modern way to help us serve the Lord and worship the Lord, but what we teach and what we preach and what we practice and how we live, there's an authority for that. And it began on the day of Pentecost. Well, that's our feeling lesson for this morning. We always close with a song of encouragement and it could be that these are some matters that kind of prick your interest. You want to talk about more, think about more. And all I would be happy to sit down with you and do just that. This morning, if you know, you need to confess the Lord Jesus before an unbelieving world. This morning, if you know, that you need to follow what Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. This morning, if there is a prayer of encouragement, strengthening, and hope that we can lift up on your behalf, if there is any spiritual need at all that we might help you with, let us know now would be a great time while we stand and as we sing together. I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he
with him, with him, all the way. Please be seated. It's always a joy to introduce a new member of our congregation, and uh, by member we mean uh, a gentleman who uh, wishes he and his wife to identify with the Pikes Peak Church of Christ as their home congregation, and through that we'll be able to use uh, Leonard and Dawn in many activities here at the congregation. Leonard uh, Townsend, if you wouldn't mind standing, Leonard has been with us for years. You recognize Leonard, he works at the Broadmoor, he worked in the summer, thank you Leonard, uh, for some number of years, and he was our summer visitor here, always here on Sunday if, he, if his work allowed him to. He became a permanent employee at, uh, at uh, the Broadmoor, and that's why he is now here in our cold winter months. He's from uh, Jamaica, uh, attends the Am Amity Church of Christ in Jamaica, and now he wants to make this his home congregation as he now lives here full time in Colorado Springs. His wife's name is Dawn, and, and uh, please meet her as well. And they have two children, one living back in Jamaica and one living here in the U.S. And so please, after services, go over and introduce yourself to Leonard. Uh, thank you. And with that, we'll turn it back to you. Our closing song, number 335, Sing and Be Happy. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend, trust in his promises grand. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he's keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by, there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust Him each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Here's we have quite a few substitutes today. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together. And we thank you for your word. God, as we go throughout our day, as well as our week, we ask that you would continue to be with us. And God, that we would trust you in everything that we do. God, be with those who could not make it uh, for sickness or whether it be spiritual sickness or physical sickness, we ask that you would uh, send your spirit, that they may be comforted and they may find encouragement and strength through us and, and us reaching out to them. God, as we leave this place, but never your presence, we ask that you will continue to uh, let your grace abide with us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.